Disclaimer! The following episode contains spoilers for MODOK Season 1. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned. Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. And this week, do 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 we're talking about MODOK! Cue the music! Hello there, Capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. My name's Scott James Meridew, and there's a show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. He's an up and coming writer for a place to hang your cape. Give it up, Capers, for Omar Khalil. How you doing, Omar? I'm good, thank you. It's good to be here, thank you. I'm really happy to have you here. So yeah, you're you're rising for a place to hang your cape now. That must be fun. Yes, it is. You know, I've uh, I've always been interested in comic books. I've always been a film geek as well. So uh, it's 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 been great so far. Yeah, it's it's a good fit. I re- I, oh, I remember the Halcyon days when I was down there in the trenches writing articles for a place to hang your cape before David Moloski stuck me here. I'm I not mean, gonna lie, I do enjoy it, but still, sometimes I miss it. You know. I mean, uh, you don't write anymore, do you? No. Well, I mean, I write other stuff outside of Place to Hang Your Cable. I don't write the articles anymore. Now I just do this. Apparently, the written word was not enough to contain Scott Meridue. I have to project my voice out into the internet about stuff I hate. Or indeed, stuff I love. Because Omar, I love MODOK. How about you? Well, I kind of... Not so much, really. I kind of disagree with you right there. A dissenting opinion. Ooh, we're going to have fun with this one. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. I shall destroy you. We'll see about that. We'll see about that. But before we get into all of that, we've got the news. First of all, from the world of Star Wars, for once it's not bad news, it's good news. Because Dave Filoni, the guy whose shoulders must be pretty goddamn tired by now after carrying all of Star Wars on his back, has been given a promotion of sorts. It was announced uh, earlier that uh, Dave Filoni was going to be the new executive creative director of a Lucasfilm and everyone was very excited and basically said yes that works for us good fucking choice however turns out there's a bit more to the story see apparently uh, a lot of people thought this was a very recent promotion and that it was just like announced like this is a new thing that's happened but apparently Dave has been basically in charge of the creative direction of Star Wars or at least Lucasfilm for some time now and it's only recently been uh announced and i mean either way i'm pretty goddamn happy about it because this guy knows what he's doing i'm a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of just one singular person having a creative director role over an entire franchise that's just me but honestly you could do worse than dave filoni do you think I mean, look, Star Wars have had a rough patch in recent years. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's an understatement, isn't it? Um, so maybe it's it's time for a change, any kind of change. So maybe that's a good thing, actually. Even if it's just, like you said, one person. But I'll take yeah. anything over what's been going on. Absolutely. And, I mean, I've been watching uh, his new show, The Bad Batch, Uh We'll discuss that in greater detail once the entirety of the episodes are out, but I'm enjoying it so far. And we all love The Mandalorian. We all love Dave. We love The Clone Wars. I I think this is a decent move on behalf of Lucasfilm. Another move which I'm sure could be considered decent, but is nevertheless very weird. It's been announced that Dwayne The Rock Johnson is now set to voice Crypto the Super Dog in an upcoming animated film DC League of Super Pets. Wow. Um, I'm generally skeptical about this project anyway. (laughs) I I mean, on the one hand, sure. On the other hand, they really are making anything right now, aren't they? Yeah, this this is what you do when you're really desperate. And DC are really desperate. And 
It's not a good move, let me tell you that. I mean, this project. But maybe adding Dwayne Johnson will increase some, you know, uh, coverage, media coverage on it. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's got the star power. And honestly, people mocked Lego Batman when that came out. I was like, oh, Lego Batman, that's going to be silly. And it's the best Batman movie ever made. So please tell fight me, me. <laughs> fight me. Please tell me you're being sarcastic right now. No, it's literally the best Batman movie ever made. I'm not saying others aren't good. I'm not even saying that others aren't great. You know, love me some Michael Keaton. But from a purely analytical, creative standpoint, my opinion is that Lego Batman is the best Batman movie ever made. I feel the sickening threat of brutal honesty and I'm wildly uncomfortable. (laughs) Well, it's better than The Dark Knight. Batman Begins. Yeah. That was, this is what happens when you make sort of, not bland movies, not great movies that are just uh-huh. so competently directed and so brilliantly acted. Because it's like, those movies kind of are not nothing films, but as close to nothing as you can get. But because Christopher Nolan is such a great director and Christop- Christ- Christian Bale is such a good actor and we had like The Joker and all of that stuff... It wasn't until the third one where, you know, the cracks started to show. Whereas Lego Batman, through ride from start to finish. Uh, Other news coming from DC, well, a DC-related figure. It's been announced. Oh, God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. That Henry Cavill is going to star in an upcoming reboot of Highlander. Now, some things, first of all, I've been saying for years that we need a reboot of Highlander. However, my assumption was that whoever would be cast as Conor McLeod, the Highlander, would be... What's the word I'm looking for? Fucking Scottish! Again, again, we have another actor that is not Scottish put in the main role of the fucking Highlander. I mean, it's better than the French fuck last time, but again, it's another Englishman. Like the last, there was a TV show that was on for a while, and the guy they had for that was fucking English, and now they got another English guy. Like, not a diss on Henry Cavill, he's a good actor, but my God, are there no actors in Scotland available? Not at all. I live in Scotland. I tell you, there's people looking for work. I absolutely agree with you. It is an outrage. It is <laughs> blasphemous. It is blasphemous. And you know, you know what? I feel responsible because this is. Oh my god, this is this is fan four stick all over again. Because I was saying for years we need a Fantastic Four reboot, and I fucking got my wish. I got my fucking cursed monkey paw wish. It, I got my reboot, and it was a monstrosity. And the same thing is happening again. This is why I can't have nice things. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> and there's not really much we know about the Lionsgate um, Highlander reboot. Um, the fact that it's coming from Lionsgate, Henry Cavill's going to be it. It's coming from this guy, Chad Staleski. I'm not familiar with him, his work. And it, Kerry Williamson uh, doing the script, a bunch of people producing, blah, 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 blah. I mean... It's not that I don't like the original 80s Highlander. It's a great movie in that it's got an awesome soundtrack, uh, great cinematography, and an interesting plot. And it did skimp on the emotional beats. I mean, the whole scene where Connor's growing up, except not really growing up, but his wife's getting older and who wants to live forever? (laughs) It gets me every time. But then you counterbalance that with Christoph or Christopher, whatever the fuck he calls himself, Lambert, doing a horrible Scottish accent, calling people haggis like that's an insult. It's not. And then you've got an actual Scottish person, Sean Connery, playing an Egyptian person who's pretending to be a Spanish person. And I'm just thinking, like, 
Who cast this? What coked up 80s executive thought that this was appropriate casting? Jesus Christ. So I thought to myself, a reboot could fix these problems as well as clear up some stuff within the Highlander lore. So like the rules, okay? The rules, the rules for Highlander. You're immortal. You can't die unless you lose your head, in which case it's game over. But I'm fine with all of that. The quickening. Ah. Uh, but they can't fight on sacred ground. Okay, this confuses. This is interests me. Is that a rule like honor system? Just like, oh, we could fight on sacred ground, but we're not going to do that because that would be cheating. In which case, I really don't know why the Kurgan would abide by that rule. Doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would, you know, stick to the honor system. Or is it like an actual physical impediment? Like whatever magic makes them immortals immortal means they literally cannot raise a blade on sacred ground. Okay, that could be kind of interesting, but why is that the case? Um, Or is it a case of if they do that, that means that they automatically forfeit the game. And also, the end result of the game, I mean, when I was watching Highlander for the first time, I thought, this is really cool, all this big climatic battle. Oh, there's a bunch of, like, really bad 80s effects doing like little demon faces swirling like this big blue vortex and it's like what's the prize what's the prize of the game and i thought to myself i know what it is it's mortality because for connor mortality would be the ultimate prize the chance to settle down and actually live a human life without having to move from place to place or watch everyone he knows and loves die For him, that's the prize. For the Kurgan, it might be ultimate power. But for him, it's mortality. Nope, turns out it's telepathy. Well, okay. (laughs) Out of fucking nowhere. Oh, oh yes, I I can, you know, interface with everyone's minds on the planet and I can bring about world peace. Cool. Doesn't really fit, fit in thematically with everything that's been going on before. I mean, do you have issues with fucking Highlander, Omar? I mean, uh, it's been a while, hasn't it? Um, hmm. I think I think you've you've said it all and more. But <laughs> I'm known yeah, for doing that. T- talk a little bit out of context, like the whole telepathy thing is just like, like just out of nowhere, absolutely out of context, and out of hmm. okay, just like literally okay. I mean, it's better than the sequel. They were aliens all along. That's just... That's just stupid. So that was the news. But before we go any further, here are some ads. Check them out. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. So, Modoc, we didn't get a Deadpool TV series with uh, Donald Glover, but we got this with Pam Noswald. I'm fine with that. That's a reasonable trade for me. It's not fantastic, but I can live with it. So, uh, this comes to us via... Okay, this is interesting, though. It comes to us via Hulu, but it's also on Disney+. Plus. But only one episode is on Disney+, Plus, whereas the entire series is on Hulu. I don't know why this has come about, Omar. Do you know? I have no idea, actually. I didn't know there was actually one episode on Disney Plus. I mean, because that's where I first went. I thought, okay, new Modoc series is going to be on Disney Plus, right? I go yeah. to Disney Plus, there's the episode. Then I thought, okay, there's one episode. Wait, I heard that it was all like released in one go, which I do appreciate and do enjoy. Uh, but then I was like, oh no, it's all on Hulu. So over to Hulu I went because I guess Hulu's still around? I didn't know that. I, I had no idea. I had to take my friend's subscription to watch it. I don't even. I mean, I mean, who's gonna? Come I mean, I like Modoc, but I'm not paying a lot of money just for Modoc. What else is on there that's been made with Marvel? The Runaways? No, thank you. Prefer the comic. No, thank you. Yeah. So, and this comes to us from uh, Pat Oswald. I guess he's a huge. Mm, classic Jack Kirby fan, uh, along with uh, co-showrunner Jordan Blum, we get a stop-motion animated MODOK series where MODOK is trying to balance his life, running in and trying to take over the world, and also family issues. I am here for this! 
I mean, I like the fact that there was the whole family plot, like the side of the plot, like taking, trying to restore his family and trying to save his family as well. Like, mm. but I, I didn't like a lot of things about the plot. The mainly the rule the world, this dystopian world he wants to rule. Yeah. I have a lot of problems with that one. I don't have a lot of problems with it, but it's something that could I thought could have been expanded on. Uh, and we're going to get into all of that. Before we do that, usually we discuss the cast at the end of the show, but now I want to switch it up and talk about uh, the cast, uh, at least the, like, the core cast straight away. So first of all, we've got Patton Oswalt as Modoc. I mean, his... <laughs> His name is like referenced in various, you know, Modoc related media is actually secretly George Tarleton, but he never gets referred to as such in this show. It's always Modoc, which I love. I really, really want them to make it canon that his mum deliberately named him Mental Organism Designed Only for Killing. Like that's on the birth certificate. I need that. That would that would also uh, also like fit in the theme and then the style of the show. I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I mean, you're basic. that's a basically a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy right there. Absolutely. Talk about Yeah, absolutely. And Patton Oswalt does a great job. I mean, I love Patton Oswalt. I think he's a fantastic comedian. I think he's a great voice actor as well as a live action actor. When we all love him as everyone's favorite chef rat, Remy. And now he's back working with Disney again, technically with Modog, as well as, interestingly, along with Jordan Blum, making uh, a Modoc comic series, of which I read the first issue of, and it's it's very... <laughs> it's interesting. I'd recommend watching the series first. Otherwise, certain elements of the comic are going to feel... Really, right the fuck out of nowhere. Admittedly, I've only read the first issue. Uh, it is very good, but let's, let's stick with the TV show for now. Uh, his wife, Jody, who is a creation uh, along with the rest of his family for the show, is voiced by Amy Garcia. I'm not familiar with her. Are you familiar with her work? I am not, actually. I, um, no, not really. I mean, she was on, um, oh, she was on Dexter. I've seen Dexter. Oh, I actually haven't seen Dexter. Maybe that's why. Maybe why. And she was also on uh, George, one of George Lopez's show. I don't know. I'm not familiar with George Lopez. Sorry. And I, I seem to vaguely remember her on that, but um, well, I've got nothing to do really with her work here, which is excellent. I like Jodie. <laughs> We're going to get into Jodie's character later on, but I really liked how she was able to balance both seeming to be down to earth and also having issues of her own. I really like that in characters, but I'm going to get into why that might necessarily be not a super original thing later. Uh, then we've got uh, voicing uh, Lou, his son Lou, um, Ben Schwartz, who is horrendously miscast. I agree, absolutely. I, I, I like don't like Ben Schwartz. He... Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. He's good. I like him. But I think for the role of Lou, he, he just, I don't know. I didn't feel it. I didn't like it that much. It very much sounds like a guy in his 30s exactly. voice <laughs> coming out of a 14 year old, 12 year old kid. It was, yeah. It, it was and peculiar. It's not like he's a bad performance. It's just he's not really doing a voice. He's just. Sound like a, and as some, I'm just really, really sick of Hollywood giving us grown man voices out of little kids. Like, if you're doing that for comedic effect, that's fine. But, like, did you watch the Captain Underpants movie by any chance? Uh, no, I have it on my watch list, but I haven't seen it yet. Well, I have, and as someone who was a fan of those books uh, growing up, uh, I was really looking forward to the movie, and it's a fantastic movie. It's actually genuinely good. But when you've got. Who's it? Ke Kevin Hart's voice coming out of one of the characters, like a 10 year old kid's character, and Thomas Middleditch as the other character. It, it doesn't work. It really does not work. Hire someone younger, 
or just don't create that character. That's a whole thing. And, you know, because Ben Schwartz's voice works in something like Sonic the Hedgehog because, yeah, he's a younger character, but he's also like a hedgehog who gives a fuck. Then something yeah. like Lou, it doesn't really work. That's not his fault. That's whoever cast him. Yeah, it's it's, it's the casting directors, I'd say. Absolutely. Uh, someone who actually does work much better as a... Uh, younger character is melissa fumero of uh, brooklyn 99 fame as oddly enough the similarly named melissa yeah i was gonna say i really liked her as as, as uh, melissa's daughter i think she did really she did a really good job she did a fantastic job and yeah. I, I liked i just love the fact that they've got two kids one kid is a normal looking boy and the other one is just like a girl modoc <laughs> and they do not explain that, that was- <laughs> My first thought, I was like, okay, why is this happening? Why is she like this and why is he like that? And they don't say anything. They just keep going with it and just like, okay, I guess I'll go along as well. I mean, <laughs> it worked. I did, I did wonder um, if they were doing like that American sitcom thing of uh, naming a character after the actor's real name. It turns out later on the series, actually, uh, no, that's not the case. What happened was uh, she was named after Melissa Etheridge. Huzzah! A man of quality! That, that's, that's a great reason for naming a kid. I absolutely um, agree. Uh, topping out the cast, over at AIM, we've got uh, Wendy McClendon-Covey as uh, Monica Rappaccini, I think her name is. She's mainly known as Monica. She's great. Uh, Beck Bennett of SNL fame as uh, Austin. Uh, John Daly as everyone's favorite silver-plated punching bag, the Super Adaptoid. <laughs> Again, I love the fact that everyone hates him, but no one explains why. He's just universally loathed by everyone he comes into contact with, despite all the good he does. It's I, I love something so delightfully mean-spirited. It's just... I don't, I don't get it either, but... <laughs> And uh, alongside a smattering of uh, celebrity voices, we've also got Sam Richardson as Gary, a random AIM foot soldier who gets his arm blasted off by Modoc in the first episode. My and- favorite character. Absolutely, my oh, favorite character. God, yeah. I mean, he's he's lovely, he's sweet, both his relationship with Modoc and his husband, Big Mike. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. chef's kiss. Brilliant. Absolutely. And there's various other Marvel characters that come into contact with Modoc, which we'll talk about as the show goes on. But one thing that I have to talk about with this show, and I mentioned, I mentioned that we'll talk about, but now's as good as time as any. Um, it became increasingly obvious as the show went on that this TV show was giving off severe rick and morty vibes yes absolutely i started comparing it like from the first episode so it took me a little while longer i'm a bit slow on the uptake i guess it took me until about like the third or fourth episode to realize like hang on a minute i mean because a lot of the characters line up like super sciencey and completely oblivious parental figure uh weird and awkward young boy character Bitchy and snarky, but very much self-assured teenage daughter. And mother figure, who seems at first to be pretty normal, but turns out to be a fucking psycho later on. I mean... uh, Oh, oh, and the super adaptoid is Jerry! Oh, uh, 100%, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's clearly Jerry! Oh my god! And it... I have no doubt that that was unintentional, because Patton Oswalt is a better writer than that. But nevertheless, I must go like, hmm. I mean, is it so wrong if they took inspiration? Absolutely not, no. And I will say that this show has an identity outside of being a Rick and Morty clone. Clearly, it has its own unique humor, unique style. uh, But there are comparisons to be made. And if you are someone who maybe doesn't like that aspect of Rick and Morty, or you do like that aspect of Rick and Morty and don't like another people copy that, maybe this show is not for you. But it is for me because I can look past that and enjoy it for what it is, especially because it uses a different style of animation. That's what I want to talk about now. So the stop motion animation. Uh, the, the show comes to us from 
uh, what's the name of the production company? Stupid Buddy uh, Studios, which is an offshoot of the Stupid Monkey production company of uh, Seth Green and also, I believe, uh, yeah, it's Matthew Seinrich, both of whom work and collaborate on Robot Chicken. Are you a fan of Robot Chicken? Uh, I mean, it's eh. I mean, I'm not a big fan of stop motion, generally speaking. See, that's the thing, see, because I am. And that's oh. part of the reason why I love Robot Chicken so much. I mean, I don't watch it heavily. Like, I mostly just, like, watch individual clips from certain uh, things. It's not really something I think, ooh, ooh it's that time of week. Gotta <laughs> get me some Robot Chicken. I gotta get that Robot Chicken. <laughs> No, but it is yeah. something I appreciate. And maybe that's because I grew up on a lot of stop motion animated stuff. Uh, I don't know um, in America or so. So sorry, just remind me, Omar, where you're from. You're from uh, Turkey, so, Jordan? No, yes, I am. I'm born in the US, but I live in Jordan. I mean, I'm originally from from Jordan, uh, but yeah. A lot of stop motion animation over there. I don't know. I mean, I grew up on uh, Pokemon and, uh, you know, these kind of shows, Batman, the animated series and stuff like that. So, no, I don't watch a lot of stop motion. Um, but, as, generally speaking, ever since I was a kid, it was never something I, I could just, aesthetically speaking, I could really get into and be involved. I don't know. Just, it didn't really grab my attention for some reason. I don't know what it is. I think it's because the kind of stop motion animation, at least in the US, that was done was mainly, um, I always accidentally call them Baskin Robbins. They're not Baskin Robbins. That's an ice cream shop. Uh, it's yeah. Ralph Bakshi, that guy, you know, who did like the Rudolph the Red Nose. Right? Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also did some animated stuff, but it was also uh, Rudolph cartoons and stuff. That seems like the most, most stop motion animation that Americans are familiar with. Yeah. But when I was growing up, I also had things like uh, Postman Pat and Morph and fucking Wallace and Gromit. Like, Aardman animation was a huge part of my childhood and still is very much as an adult. And granted, that's different kinds of stop-motion animation. Like, that uses uh, plasticine uh, sort of things. Whereas uh, Robot Chicken and Modoc use uh, models with sort of, like, clip-on faces and stuff you can clearly see. Uh, but it's something I, I I really enjoy, and I like seeing used uh, more and more in different ways. A big standout for me was a recent, well, I say fairly recent, it's got a new one out that I need to watch, actually, a uh, film by Charlie Kaufman called Anomalisa. Did you ever watch that film? I actually never heard of it. It's a fantastic movie. It's based on the stage play that he did, uh, featuring the same actors, actually. And I always like it when uh, they get the original cast from the stage play into a film adaptation of that and uh it's about this guy who's going for a little bit of a crisis and stuff and it's it uses stop motion animation but it doesn't try to hide it a lot of stop motion animation tries to trick you into seeing thinking like what you're watching is real and can do that to varying degrees of success some things can do it really well and some things can't uh but anomalisa what they did was they showed you the clear outlines where they clip together the models and you know, there was it was it was it was very much like a sort of fresh of the factory look, and gave it a sort of air of artificiality that really worked in the film's favor. And I like seeing creative stuff like that done. And yeah, see, that's that's the thing. Even though I don't like stop motion, like personally, I think like it it fit well well with the Modoc, like the theme and the way it's mm. done, and the writing and the humor of it all. I felt like stop motion actually. Uh, supported all of that. Yeah. So it was also something refreshing to watch, something new, something different, something to experiment with. It was it was ballsy, and I liked that. Yeah, because it, it was used in a creative way. It was used in a very, um, not atmospheric, but was, uh, in a very cinematic way. They I, didn't just make it, uh, you know, like, still shot, like, robot chicken. You know, they've got a lot of that stuff to do, so, you know, they skimped down on terms of production value. Not so with Modoc, they went all out. And it, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a kid playing with his action figures, but what he sees in his mind when he's playing with his action figures. Oh, that's 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 a good analogy. I, I, I agree. And then, like, when you were talking about, like, the, the cinematography also, you can see, like, some shots that seemed, like, handheld, and they would, like, move... 
Japan when they're like having a conversation or something like that. That was that was the production quality is actually really good. Yeah, and it also it speaks to um, a lot of investment in the series because stop motion animation, regardless of what kind you do, is painstaking and slow and oftentimes expensive. So Hulu, Marvel, whoever doing this shows an awful lot of faith in Patton Oswald and John Blum and just the show in general. And I think it paid off for the most part. And I think now we should actually start talking about the show specifically. Um, what, I, what I like about all the episode titles is that they're references, well, some of them are at least, are references to uh, various, like... Movies and no, no, not movies, just like oh. various uh, Marvel comics. So, like, um, oh. just, so the first one is called If This Be Modoc, and that's a reference to an old Tales of Suspense comic. Um, I think one of them is a reference to a Fantastic Four comic. Uh, the very last one, Days of Future Modocs. I like that is, one. It's clearly, a, we all know what that's referencing. <laughs> Absolutely. I tell you, we all get that. We all saw that movie. <laughs> brilliant movie yeah and so we start off with modog as a little kid oh my god little kid because here's the thing in the comic and to a lesser extent the crap video game that has microtransactions up its ass portrayed modog originally as a normal guy george tarleton who gets mutated and cybernetic until he becomes the fucking big head shall i make a robin williams reference no i shall not but in in the, in the show, he starts off having a big head anyway, and he he's revealed later on that he did cybernetically augment himself. But no, no, he's clearly a kid with a massive fucking head right from the get go. As his mum points out by referencing his head as womb destroying, brave soldier, mum. Yeah. <laughs> And he's just like, oh, some kids broke my inventions. And she's like, don't worry, you womb-destroying big head kid. You're going to change the world. And it flashes forward to the future. He's like, I am going to change the world by taking it over. It's Modoc and the aim. It's Modoc and the aim. One has a big head. The other's his company. The song doesn't really work. Moving on. It's good enough. You know, and, I like it. And we see him uh, in mid battle with Iron Man, voiced by John Hamm. John Hamm has been popping up at a lot of stuff I've been reviewing lately. First <laughs> Invincible, now this. It's, I He's really get the where? sense that he'll be in anything if someone just asks nicely enough and he can be just a little bit silly. He must have been so fucking bored working on Mad Men. I mean, I would imagine so. I mean, have you seen it? I have seen it. I stuck with it for like the first half of the first season. It's just like, yeah. you know what? I'm not really relating to all these, you know, approaching middle age, 19, early 1960s ad men with all of their affairs and bourbon drinking and cigar smoking and various moral quandaries that really don't really match up to all the other moral quandaries that every non-white man <laughs> character has. Non white, non white, you know, male character has in the show is, yeah, I don't, I don't really care. It's a good show. I just do not care. I'm, I'm in it purely for the opening theme song. You're like, nah, 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 nah. It's a classic. Like that's the highlight. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like, oh, I'm really getting sucked into this world, and then it's just like, oh my god, do we have to watch the kid from Angel sneer at everything for another episode. God damn, Jared Harris, could you please liven things up? Oh, you're dead. Shit. Anyway, he's fighting Iron Man. Things seem to be going poorly because you know he's a supervillain fighting Iron Man. What the fuck do you think is gonna happen? But. He does manage to snatch a small victory as he grabs Iron Man's boot. Upgrades, people. Upgrades. And back at AIM, he proudly displays the boot. Like it's a massive fucking trophy. And it becomes clear very uh, early on that Modok is not a great runner of AIM, as evidenced by the utter contempt Monica has for him 
thinking that he's a terrible scientist and a terrible supervillain and that it would be much better if she were running it. And Modok is pretty oblivious to all of this. And especially since the fact that he has to be told by someone that AIM is pretty much going out of fucking business. Do you know, when I was watching the first episode, it reminded me of Megamind. Have you seen Megamind? Fucking love Megamind. Absolutely terrific movie. It, it, this, I love the fact that he was this super genius, you know, villain, but he's not actually good at being a villain. He's not good at being the bad guy. You know, no. and I just love that. And um, he was outplayed by, uh, I forgot his name. The, the Is it Austin? Austin, yeah. Yes, Austin. He was outplayed by this, oh. you know, generic character that's, and, and I, Everything and I, like I hate thing. about the corporate modern day mindset. Hey, I'm not like your average yeah. CEO. I'm like your buddy, man, but I'll still fire you. Yeah, I, I see. Em- I see your fake corporate culture. <laughs> Austin embodies that perfectly. I feel like, generally speaking, I wanted to say this about the show is like a parody in our society, you know, mm-hmm. modern day society. And I love Austin's take. But I mean, I, I once had a job interview with Apple. It was like a group interview thing. They they don't understand human beings. <laughs> how human beings talk and what human beings want. They understand gadgets and tech gizmos fine, but they expect you to talk to people in ways that no one actually does, at least not in the UK. And what's weird is I know for a fact that m- at least some Apple employees don't adhere to this weird mindset because before that, I'd gone to Apple to get my phone fixed. And every time I you know, was over there trying to get it fixed, um, all the employees spoke to me normally. Like I was an actual fucking human being and it's, uh, and not at all like what they tell you to do in the uh, interview process. So clearly people know better than, you know, Tim Cook, whoever's cooking this shit up. <laughs> but uh, things aren't going great for Modoc yeah. at home either because uh, he goes home to his wife, uh, a lifestyle vlogger slash brand ambassador, Jody, uh, a the occupation of her, which is probably just as evil as supervillain, if not more so. I agree. Brandon, Brandon. No, no. I, I, I think it's intentional. I never 100% got a handle on what Jody's job was. Like, they explain it, but like, and she's like, she's got a book coming out, but she's like yep. a lifestyle girl, like telling people how to live their lives. I'm just thinking, thinking... That's what a cult leader does. <laughs> I mean, isn't she? I think she says she's like an influencer or something. I think she That's uses the word. That's not a thing. I That's... mean, look. <laughs> I know some people think it's a thing, but it's not a thing. That is something that is attributed to you, not something you can put on your fucking CV. Influencer. I've had this show for years. I haven't influenced jack shit. I mean, you don't know about that. I mean, I'm sure you have. I've, you can... in, I've I've influenced bitter resentment and hostile intentions from my fellow at Place to Hang Your Cape colleagues whenever I drag them onto my profanity laden rants. That's what I've done. That's my sphere of influence. Anyway, he's also got his son Lou, who is described as weird. Honestly, compared to a lot of other you know teenage TV sons, he seems pretty fucking normal. Yeah, I saw him as like the net. Like he's the most normal one. He's the He's the normal character in the show. He's like the human being, the normal human being. I mean, I mean, I, I kind of aspire to be like him. He's entirely devoid of self-awareness, but in a healthy way. He has no real, you know, hang-ups. And he's just very confident and he likes magic. And apparently that's too weird from the guy whose body is like 85% face. <laughs> and shoots lasers out of his forehead. Yeah, exactly. And then we've also got Melissa, who is... She has the fucking best introduction ever. It starts off with her saying like, oh, my life is ruined because I psychologically destroyed this one person at my school for completely arbitrary reasons. And I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm going to like this character. (laughs) I can work with this. Uh, uh, She's she's my second favorite character after MODOK, I'd say. No, after the the Mordok's, uh, I forget his name, um, the guy without his hand. 
Oh, Gary, yeah. Gary, yeah. He has such a generic I'm... name. <laughs> Here's the thing. I think I'm also they're cheating with the name Gary because that reminds me of the robot chicken character from all their Star Wars specials. He was a stormtrooper voiced by, um, I think it was Brendan Fraser. And it's just like, okay, so we've got a guy in a uniform, works for an evil organization called Gary, whose face we never see and has a sort of slightly mysterious home life. And it's sort of the everyman of the organization like that seems very similar like if they hadn't called him if they called him anything else if they called him phil or something wouldn't have noticed but gary it's a bit too close i see you seth i need to call him seth mcfarland then seth green there's too many seths (laughs) and yes and then also the Robot the Super Adaptoid. I'm not familiar with the Super Adaptoid as a character. I'm presuming he's a character from the comics. I would assume he, so. He's just there. They know, again, they don't explain why he's there. Like, is he the family robot? Is, but everyone just accepts his presence. No one questions it. Uh, despite the fact that he's super useful and can transform into anything. How the fuck did Motor Problem... Like, sell that! If you hate the Super Adaptoid so much and your company's going out of business, fucking sell that to Tony Stark. Like, here, I built this robot that can become literally anything. Pay me moolah, and you're back in the red. But- I think it's, it was one of those plot devices that you just have that yeah. sometimes... Just, you, just don't, you don't explain why or whatever. You just, he's there just to help the plot. Or He's Rick's portal gun with a voice. Yeah, literally. Basically, yeah. <laughs> and Modoc is uh, all very happy about him having Iron Man's boot, uh, despite the fact that Jody is trying to tell him, like, hey, I got a massive new you know, boost to my career with this new job. Would it be happy for me about that? He's just like, boot. <laughs> and oh, it comes to a head where he says, I want to thank you, Jody, for sleeping on the couch tonight while I share a marital bed with Iron Man's boot. <laughs> That's the kind of humor this show has, and I love it. It's it's so delightfully mean spirited and really, really funny. I mean, are we going to talk about the humor yet? And let's talk about the humor. So I like it. I, I it sort of appeals to me. You don't mm-hmm. like it at all, do you? I do not like it one bit. So why don't you like it? Okay. Explain yourself. <laughs> okay, so I have a problem with a lot of like comedy shows or movies that are coming out in recent years. Um, a lot of them use this this style of comedy that's really blatant and shallow, in my opinion. That's, okay, this is the funny joke. This is the punchline. Laugh now. This is... And sometimes they overdo it as well. Like, Modoc, Mm -hmm. I feel like they try to put a lot of humor. They, They... Every line needs to be funny. Whereas they could have worked on the plot to make it stronger and better of each episode. And I just don't like that style of comedy. I'm going to use a uh, comparison. Like, if you want to compare Seinfeld with Friends, have you seen both of both shows? I've seen Friends more than I've seen Seinfeld. I've seen the old uh, scene and uh, episode of Seinfeld. I got put off mm-hmm. by Jerry Seinfeld's acting, or lack thereof. I mean, it grows on you. And yeah, yeah he, he can't act, but he's a brilliant writer and comedian. So Seinfeld... I never said he couldn't act. I said he wasn't acting in that. I mean, have you seen his magnum opus... B movie. I can we just pass that? Let's not go down the rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, let's not. That was... <laughs> the memes, so... not the memes. <laughs> so Seinfeld has this really subtle kind of humor. There's actually uh, there's it doesn't have a punchline. That's one of the the, 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 the style of writing that it has. It it's doesn't have nothing. It sh- it's a show about nothing. It's th- you choose when to laugh. The thing that you relate to. It's it's a social commentary as well that helps that style of comedy. Whereas Friends, a lot of times, it, the conversation haven't happen is happening, and then Joey says something, and okay, okay, this is the the moment I should laugh. And it kept evolving to recent com- recent like years the, the comedy shows and movies that are just com- that, are, that are coming out, like Batman, the Lego Movie, the one that I uh, dislike. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it also has that kind of plain comedy and I personally don't like that I like that really subtle kind of comedy the comedy that it's not laugh out loud kind of comedy 
The, the curbs oh. your enthusiasm. Yes. The um, I don't know every other example. The Seinfeld, obviously. Seinfeld, and um, also like if you want to compare one of my favorite comedy movies, Hot Fuzz, to any comedy oh. movie from Hollywood, Hot Fuzz doesn't have that laugh out loud kind of comedy. You know, it's really sarcastic as well. I feel like. I can. I mean, I wouldn't classify Hot Fuzz in the same vein as those other examples we gave you, but I get where you're coming from. But like the style of comedy, I'm just talking about generally yeah. the style of comedy. That I like the subtle one more than the obvious, blatant one. That's why I feel like it's, it's like spoon feeding. It's like, okay, I just I don't want to laugh. I want to know what happens with the plot or with the story or with the what's going on with this family. I don't want to laugh right now with this comment that feels out of place. I mean, I think the reason why I like this sort of comedy is because, yeah, it's got those examples. And I have seen that done very poorly, especially, honestly, 99% of American sitcoms, at least, actually British sitcoms, in fairness, as well, are just a complete dreck. Because, like I say, it's just say one thing, say another thing, punchline, ha 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 ha. And it's very stilted and it's very slow paced, just like, could could we get a move on? But I, I think where Modoc sees is the pacing. I think when it needs to let a scene, scene breathe, it'll let a scene breathe. But often the jokes are very quick fire and they don't linger too much. There are a few times where they do a bit of a back and forth thing and I'm wondering like, ooh, are they going to overstay the welcome? And they rarely, for me at least, if ever did. And I can understand why that would be unappealing to some people. But for me, it works very well because I like my quick fire comedy, especially when it's good quick fire comedy. And when you he, when he throw in creative ideas and, you know, interesting characters, as well as moments where actually, you know, we're always oh, going to take this a bit seriously right now. And it doesn't have. Again, with Rick and Morty making that comparison again, Rick and Morty has, again, the more subtle sort of humor, the more. um you know, yeah. laybacks sort of humor. So they don't have to have a super fast pace for their comedy because they can just, you know, go like, oh, God damn it, Morty, you messed it all up again. Oh, gee, yeah. Rick. Like that, that you don't need any more than that. Those are good accents. Those, those, they're, they're good impressions. Fuck you. Hey, I, was gonna, I was just going to say, that's actually really good. <laughs> it's okay. I'm working on it, okay? Your yeah, Morty's really the, good. The, the only... Impression. I've got several impressions. The only one I've ever honestly been able to say to myself in the mirror, I have nailed this impression, is the a no, a no, a yes guy from The Simpsons. You know that guy? I haven't seen The Simpsons in years. I gave up on it. I don't know. I, I mean, it's based on this other character from like American sitcoms, but he's like, he's a, like an upscale, you know, a uh, customer assistant at like Costington's, the upscale department store. Mm-hmm. And when someone asks him the question, he's like, Yes. Do you have like this thing? Well, let me just check. A no. A no. A yes. Like that I've got down pat. It's just everything else I'm just working on. That is gold. It's, it's gold if someone actually knows the character. If not, then I'm sort of <laughs> useless. What the fuck were we talking about? The um, comedy. The comedy, the comedy. Yeah. So I think the pace works in its favor. And I, I like the fact that, yes, the humor is, it's not really punchline heavy. It's more like say a funny thing, say a funny thing. And it's, it's, there's a beat, you know, there's a uh, there's a back and forth, which also helps as well. I don't like it when it's just like, as you say, set up, set up, set up, punchline. Uh, well, comes do that these days. But I, I think I think what makes it work really is the fact that at first, at least for the bulk of the show, um, it feels very in keeping with the characters and how they would react to certain situations. There are times later on in the show where it's just like, why would you say that? Why would you do that? And Modoc, I think, is the bigger, at least, offender of that sort of thing. There's this one, uh, the, is it the, um, yes, yeah, it's the very last episode yeah. where they're trying to get a bunch of people to do this thing. We won't spoil it just yet. And Melissa has got this plan and Mono completely ruins that plan by just going on this weird non sequitur tangent about casting for a TV show and just completely ruining it. And it, it feels like this was written for a completely different character. All of his yeah. jokes previously 
made sense for Modok and the character that had been established within this show. But then all of a sudden it was like, this feels like something that Deadpool would do, you know? I, I agree with you on that. I feel like the comedy did fit the, the the theme of the show and the characters themselves. It was appropriate to, to what they were doing. But the thing is, maybe I've been a little bit unfair when I, when I judged the comedy because I was comparing it to Rick and Morty. And mm. the thing is, I was looking at Modoc as, okay, this is, it doesn't feel like this comic booky show, right? It's not, it can be like a show out of nowhere. It's not necessarily from a comic book because, and I was looking for a plot and all those story elements that if you watch Rick and Morty, you will find like the adventure and the hero's journey, the call to the adventure and stuff like that. And when he Quick goes on an adventure, Morty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I still, I, I, it's too it's, gruff and gravelly. I need to work on it. Go on. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, you're, you're on the right path. Yeah. Um, and I was looking at Modoc, and I was like, okay, I want to see a good story, a good plot, and a good, uh, you know, climax to each episode or to each storyline or story in each episode. Mm. And I didn't find that because I felt like the humor was getting in the way a lot of times. For example, uh, is it the third episode when he has, the, when he goes as a as a special guest for a conference or something? I don't is think it, do you remember? that. I don't think that's the. Th- Third episode, I think that's um could be second, not third. No, no, it's not the second. Could be third or fourth. No, it is the third. It's sorry, my mistake. It is the third episode. It I do apologize. Third. Yeah. So, and uh, this concierge for the hotel keeps embarrassing him, doesn't he? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and there are some Mr. funny Modoc, moments. Mr. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I double checked with the manager, and he says you definitely can't go in the hot tub if you had diarrhea for more than forty eight hours ad nauseum. It was that moment. I was like, okay, that's that's a good that's that's funny, but mm, I feel like gross. I mean, <laughs> and but I feel like it's just too much. It's a bit overkill and. He kept, he kept going. He kept saying the embarrassing stuff, didn't he? Yeah. And some people can might find that funny, which is normal because it is funny. But for me personally, I felt like that was okay. You need to dial it back a little bit and just move on. I mean, it's fun the first time, and then they repeated a couple more times. It was like, yeah. Oh, you know, we get it. We get it. I, I, if there's one thing that turns me off to a comedy one thing it's obvious jokes as in jokes that i can see coming and i know exactly like the best example i can think of was a show that was on uh, in britain a few years ago called siblings it was about these this brother and sister who were sort of fuck-ups in life and uh the guy sibling was uh, there's a word for that brother i i don't know the no word i can think from male I, sibling I no idea <laughs> He's in a cafe and he doesn't really know what to do with his day. And he's like, sees this other guy working on a laptop. He's like, hey, what you doing? And then he's got like a cup of coffee. And he's like, oh, imagine if I spilled my coffee on your laptop. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then he spills the coffee on the laptop. And I'm just thinking, well, this is the death of comedy. Click. Yeah. That's... This is on the BBC, I'd like to point out. Prime time. It was rubbish. Wow. I hate jokes like that. That's actually what um it that's what turned me off of Fleabag initially. And Fleabag is a fucking amazing show. But like the first five minutes or so, I sort of could see where the jokes were going, and it just completely turned me off. It's just like I, I I'm I'm paying to see you make me laugh. And if I'm already coming up with the jokes before you can even say the jokes, what's the point of having you here? I could just imagine the show in my head and get the same amusement while like doing something else. You know, I could be multitasking right now. Explain yourself, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Oh, that's right. You can't hear me because you're on the TV and I'm in my flat in Edinburgh. Well, aren't you just a TV living so-and-so? My mental health is deteriorating with every single episode I do this show, dear God. Anyway... So yeah, that's that's the way, and it's got so it's got its pros, it's got its cons. Honestly, I think um, I think you'll know if you'll like the humor within the first episode. It, yeah, it's its best foot first foot forward, and you really get a sense of what the show is right from the get go because it's see Modoc being like 
self-aggrandizing and, you know, really arrogant. Then his company no. gets taken away from him by Austin, head of tech company Grumble. I mean, okay, so American uh, television executives, writers, producers, whoever, I hesitate to, well, I'm sorry to tell you that we are running out of tech company parody names. Okay, I think we're down to like five now. Space them out, or either either that, or get permission from actual companies like Google and stuff. Because otherwise, we're just not going to have any more parody names left. Jesus. I mean, do they have to do a parody name? But okay, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so Grumble takes over AIM and severely demotes Modoc, and it seems like things couldn't get worse for him. Um, but then Jody tells him she wants a divorce. Modoc gets a divorce. I mean, we knew this was coming from the trailers. I mean, when I first saw the trailer for this, I thought, oh, I'd heard of a Modoc TV series in the works, but I didn't think they'd actually fucking do it. Is this going to be any good? Click. I must see this show, dear God. He sings Third Eye Blind in the bathroom. And this this one is this is what um establishes the show from the get go. It's got a lot of jokes and it's got a lot of Modoc being a fuck up, but it's also interspersed with him uh you know doing stuff for AIM and trying to fix his family. And there are times when they balance those two elements really well, and other times where you almost completely forget about the other plot threads because they basically drop them for more than a few episodes. I feel like they could have been interwoven a bit better. Uh what do you think? Yeah, um, I agree with you there. I mean, I like the plot with the family, the whole family plot better hmm. because it was a bit, you know, it was something fresh and new to the, the super villain take. You know, it humanized him and just gave him a little bit of a, you can relate to him. But, Don't tell your mother about this or this we had one of those divorces where it definitely is the kid's fault. <laughs> I like that one. Um, that was a good line. <laughs> Uh, he's such a good character, honestly. Um, yeah. uh, but about, but I feel like yeah, they could have balanced it a little bit better. Maybe, uh, maybe. Thing is, there's a lot going on in this in the, in these ten episodes. If you think about it, there's a lot going on. A lot that went unexplained. Twenty five minute episodes, only ten episodes. So yeah, there is a lot of plot. You do get plenty yeah. of plot for your buck. Yeah, and there's a lot of backstory as well that wasn't also. Uh, didn't have a lot of context to it hmm. so maybe it was a bit difficult to balance them both these two main storylines but i believe they could have done a better job i yeah. but, it's great yeah. great for a first season like these are small these are nitpicks these are nitpicks that can be worked out with a second season and i do hope we get a second season i, I haven't mean, heard anything about that but who knows? i think they have an out i think they've said they're working on one i i think so i'm not sure though Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would watch it. I would, I would, I would absolutely watch it. And yeah. Venice, this only came out, uh, we're recording um, you know, late on Sunday, and it's uh, it, it came out on Friday. So it's it, it's been three days. It's been yeah. three days. I, I think you know, there's plenty of time for it to pick up steam. And yeah. this is what it basically establishes, establishes what the, the show is going forward, like we said. Uh, I think, but also the second episode throws in a bunch of twists, i.e. long running multi-episode story arcs. Uh, Modoc tries to fix his relationship with Jody by taking her back into the past to go to a concert that they were never able to go to, a Third Eye Bly concert. And uh, various shenanigans happen, including a conflict with a younger version of Modoc. Um... And they accidentally get stuck in the past, forced to, you know, watch life go by. And then they grow old together and they realize, oh, we were meant to be together. And they try and tell their, once they catch up to the present, their past present selves. Yeah. I have one? I have a strong opinion on that, actually, just uh, regarding how it was done. Go on. So the thing is, I love... <laughs> I love anything that has to do with time travel and that's well done. I love time travel. And I feel like that moment where they they wanted to say we belong together, right? Let's tell mm-hmm. them they belong together, that we belong together. I feel like they could have focused on that a little bit more to 
to show how important that thing is emotionally speaking. Because it's such mm-hmm. like they missed out on what could have made them stay together instead of actually moving on with the with the divorce. And I feel like that moment passed so quickly, and I'm like, I I just want to see more emotion into it because it's such a powerful moment, and it's a moment that cannot be repeated. This is it, and they're gonna. I was like, okay, they're, she's gonna let him go away and leave, and he's gonna go to his new apartment. And I feel like if they focused on that just a little bit more, like allow it to sink in with us, the audience. It would have hit harder, like emotionally speaking. I would have been like, "Oh, wow!" I didn't have the "oh wow" moment at that at that scene, and I wanted that "oh wow" moment. I mean, I, actually, I completely agree with you because the show does have emotional moments. It actually just like, "Oh, we're actually doing this quite a bit seriously," and most of the time they work. But in that one, a little bit of elaboration, especially considering the whole episode is basically about their relationship yeah. and you know the problems that they both had. They could have gone a bit further with it. They could have uh, explored that a little bit more. Uh, they don't even have to explore it a lot because then it would just like be banging the point over on the head. Just just a bit more focus, just a, a conversation. They try and do it just visually because with them growing up together yeah. and not growing up together, growing old together. And it doesn't not work. It just could have used a, just a, some, like I say, an emotional linchpin as it were. Yeah. And uh, certain linchpins do come around later, but uh, not here. Uh, then we get the episode, like I said, where they go to uh, the seminar thing with uh, the diarrhea hot tub incident. Uh, yeah, this explores one. Modoc's relationship with his daughter, Melissa. The fundamental issues of which get brought up repeatedly in this first season don't actually get resolved. And at first, that makes sense in the third episode, but by the last episode, the same, a similar thing at least happens, the whole casting thing we mentioned, and it yeah. doesn't have the same... I think they were just like looking towards the end toward, on that very last episode. They're just like, okay, finish line in sight, let's just get this out. And, and it's explored much more, much better, I think, in the third episode. And... Oh God! So then he, so he tries to uh, disrupt this party that's going on with the brood by opening a portal to their planet. Instead, he accidentally summons these fucking Cooper-looking things called the Seagramides. Seagramides? I can't remember. I, for, I forgot the name, but they look like Cooper, basically. That's my initial thought. They're the ultimate hedonites. Yeah. Hedonists. Hedonites? I don't know. I actually have no idea. And. They party so hard that in the span of just like a couple of hours, they party everyone to death. That's, I mean, I don't know if that's in the comics, but if not, that's that needs to be in the comics. Imagine the <laughs> Avengers so... fighting those things. <laughs> oh God, they're making the Vision Break dance. I would watch that. I would pay to watch that. <laughs> this is also. Than... This is also the episode where we're introduced to the shattering figures known as the board. Bom, bom, bom. Mm-hmm. And ends with Modoc killing all the party animal aliens. And this is when we, I think this is the episode where we first see our first dose of gore. Well, that was grim. It's. Is it? Is it the first episode that we see the, like. I, I think oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, so. At least, at least that in a overt way. I think the first episode we yeah. see Gary's arm get blown off. Yes, but aside from that, we don't really have a lot of stuff. And I thought to myself, okay, this seems to be pretty much you know for all ages sort of thing. Uh, there's a couple of swear words here and there, but it's pretty uh, pretty tame. Oh my god! Oh, they are raspberry jam. They're all jam. Oh no! And it only get, it gets worse from there. It's clearly Seth Green is like, hey, so uh, you know these are uh, little action figures you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kill them. Oh. <laughs> I kind of like that, that they did that with stop motion Yeah, as well. I feel like it was a bit sarcastic. I don't know. It felt that way. I mean, 
it's very creative and it's very it but it, it took me a little bit off guard i got used to it because that stuff doesn't really bother me that much uh-huh. but if you th- again I, if you're thinking this is going to be like a fun you know cool show for your little kids or maybe even your young teens it's not not no no you. uh that's the uh the third episode uh fourth ap- episode mode oh god this episode i honestly when I realized where this episode was going, I thought this is going to be torture, but it actually got funnier and funnier for me. Modoc yeah. tries to enter into a villain bar called the, like the Soho bar. That's got like Mr. Sinister and the leader uh, voiced by Bill Hader, but doesn't get in because you know, it's fucking Modoc. It's sort of like steal Captain America's shield and we'll let you in. So it goes to the bar with no name, which is an actual location in the Marvel universe. I like that that gets a little mention. Where you find like the most like Z list tier supervillains ever. Some of most of whom actually I was not even familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um I was familiar with the Melter and Armadillo, but I had no idea who Pound Cakes, Ten Pin, and Anger the Screamer were. And frankly, I was glad not knowing. Yeah, I mean <laughs> I was happy back then. <laughs> um I actually didn't know m- most of them. Yeah, same as you. And you just know Pat Oswalt just going through like his long boxes of comics, just like we're the stupid ones. Where are the stupid ones? Walrus. I think too many people know that. The Fly. Too many people know about it. The Beetle. He's actually kind of cool. He wouldn't work. Ten like... Pin. A guy who like juggles exploding ten pins. <laughs> Sign yes. you up. Yes, absolutely. Bring him on. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> And uh, their voice, oh God, some of the voice actors. So uh, Bill Hader, uh, again, as well as being the leader, is also Angar the Screamer. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg is Pound Cakes. Dustin Yabara is Armadillo. And uh, Chris Parnell, actually making a return from, well, no, no, uh, coming over from Rick and Morty, is Tenpin. And I thought Mark Hamill was the melter. Turns out there's this guy called Eddie Pepitone. I. He sounds like Mark Hamill. I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I don't. I don't remember actually like the voice right now. I don't remember Is what Mark Hamill. Like, Grammy oh. sort of like. Uh, oh, I New didn't... York sort of style. Yeah, like... yeah I. <laughs> I didn't get that vibe. I didn't think he was mark hamill at the moment i again i just because i've recently seen invincible so i got mark hamill on the oh. brain and so he basically recruits and says hey you want to come with me and break into avengers tower what follows is the most side-splitting comedy of errors i've ever seen in a you know short form stop motion <laughs> comedy series about superheroes admittedly i've only seen a few of those but you know and because they just go from you know misadventure to misadventure he's desperately trying to get them all you know focused but that because they're such terrible villains they keep getting <laughs> sidetracked my favorite bit was where they went by armadillo's ex-wife's house where she finds out we find out that she's been shacking up with the mandrill in a robe an open robe we wow. we see things Dear that's God. Yeah, there's more no yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> it's pixelated, but it you can see it. The, yeah, the fact that you can see it and even, like... It's basically, like, five pixels. It's, so many, it's so few pixels, you might as well <laughs> not have pixels. We're scarred either way. Yeah, you, you can't move past that. Yeah, and it ends with them, you know, breaking up and him being mean to them, and then they make up and they go to the beach, and it's, like, a really nice moment. But here's the thing. Throughout the whole episode, we see Melter has a bit of a cough. Then we see him cough into a handkerchief full of blood. And I think, are they going to talk about that? Are they going to reference that? And they don't. Nope. And then it ends with a bit of a cone joke for the whole thing. Is Melter is coming up with an idea for a melted grilled cheese sandwich food truck. And Modoc's guessing like a bunch of names. He's just like, I don't like those names. Then he tells Modoc the actual name at the end. Modoc's just like, that's a fucking awesome name. Then Melter dies. And it's sad. It is. They made the Melters' death 
sad. Mainly because of what we're feeling for Modo, because he just started to get to know the guy, he started to like him, and he was actually quite distraught at his death. And it's it's really like he likes like he, they're about to leave the beach, and but Melter's still sat there. Modo comes back, is like, "Hey, Melter, are you okay?" And he touches him, and he sees his head, like, "Oh." The sad music plays. Do you this... feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel it in yourself? You know, close enough. Um, <laughs> that was. This is one of the most like. This is one of one of these emotional moments that we talked about. You know, these moments that, like, whoa. Mm. You sit there and you just contemplate about that moment, and I, I like that. I mean, it's sad, yes, like you said, but. Good sad. I like it because it, it doesn't feel forced. It felt no. earned. It was right at the very end of the episode. Yeah. That's the note yeah. the episode ends on. And it's really cool. And this is the thing. This is the thing. It, it, this show, it's so easy to just be like, oh, it's a funny show about like a supervillain that's like a big head, but he's got a family. What's he going to do now? And there's this one bizarre example I can think of that. I cannot, for the life of me, remember the name of this show. I only watched one episode, and that was more than enough. The show, ages ago, I think it had Jason Sudeikis in it. And it was about, like, this 80s fantasy Saturday morning cartoon hero character who, for some reason, lives in the real world, got married and had a kid with this woman, and then they got divorced. And it's like him trying to... I can see you trying. See Omar, you're trying to. Um, I'm trying to trying to remember where that's from. Yeah, it did not last long. It's like him trying to relate to his son. His son's like a normal kid, but he wants to like slay dinosaurs and stuff like that. And it's really fucking stupid and pointless. And the the humor is truly awful. It's everything you don't like about the humor in Modoc is present in that show, but without any charm or interesting characters. And they just think like, oh, he's an animated character. We put him in the, like the real world in the suburbia, and that's automatically funny. No, you need to work hard and you need to be creative. And things like that is part of what makes Modoc stand out from that sort of thing. Very next episode, he attends the Melter's funeral. Yep. And completely upstages his grieving widow. <laughs> and I love it when he's so mean-spirited like that. And he basically and then this follow it's weird though. The previous episode yep. was a comedy of errors. The next episode is also a comedy of errors. I feel like that could have been spaced out a bit more, but it's all about him like saying, you know what? I'm now confronting my mortality for the first time. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill Iron Man with a black hole gun and the whole episode about him trying to pass through all this bureaucracy to get a black hole gun. And it's good. It's funny. But we just had that. Yeah, I agree with you. It's 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 a bit overkill to have it like consecutive and two consecutive episodes. Maybe maybe they could have spaced it out a little bit. That would have been I felt that. You're right about that one. Yeah, I mean, it's not that it doesn't work. It works. It's just again, we just got that. And considering the fact that not all the episodes are, you know, structured or paced the same way, uh this this is not something that really needed to happen. Uh, one great thing about the episode was it explores uh, Monica's resentment of Modoc, and the whole. As someone who's you know dipped his toe into the various jobs I've had, bureaucratic waters, I can tell you, see, I, I, I felt Modoc's frustration about not being able to check out a black hole gun from the armory without passing all these weird corporate tier structures. It's. <laughs> Again, it's a parody on on our society. I I I I had a job once where I was technically working for Oxfordshire County Council, and let me tell you, British, especially English, county council jobs are the fucking worst because the amount of red tape and corporate structuring and health and safety you have to go through, it's enough to fucking choke Galactus. It's awful. Wow. And However, the episode does end with a interesting idea as it's uh, revealed that Austin is working for <gasps> Hexus the Living Corporation. Bum, bum, bum. 
I don't know if they're from a comic, but considering the way Marvel Comics have been going, like they've been embracing the lol so random human a bit more recent years. I wouldn't mm-hmm. be surprised if it is from the comics. I actually don't know, but I, I didn't bother to I'd, do research. I would assume it this is. only came out I, on Friday. I've been watching the see, show. I binged it today, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't. There are a lot of things I don't know about, but um. Again, see some unanswered questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some research. Yeah, because, I mean, it's a cool idea, the idea of this entity, this eldritch entity from outer space being a living corporation that establishes on a planet, uses up its resources, and then moves on. I mean, I want to say it's obvious commentary, but it's also kind of not. Like, I... like. Oh, corporations use up resources and, you know, they're evil and stuff. We've seen that before, but we've yep. never seen a living corporation that moves from planet to planet. That's something I haven't seen before, at least. That has a hive uh, mind and stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. It sounds like something Rick and Morty would have done, but Modoc beat it to them. Beat mm. them to So, One thing Rick and Morty did do was portals, and we've seen a few of those recently. And the next yep. episode features Modoc uh, creating a portal to Asgard, and he uses that to get rid of his rubbish. That is hilarious. I really love, love yeah. that. And <laughs> you know what's weird, though? Do you know what's weird? Yeah. I don't think they had the rights to a lot of Marvel characters. Because we see Iron Man and a few others. But we do not see Thor. Yeah, I agree with you on that. We just see, like, the hammer and stuff like that. And it's like... What is the fucking point of all this cross-promotional, synergistic... Like, maybe it's because it was done for Hulu and stuff, and they had to, like, buy each individual character. That's why there's so many new characters just for the show. But... But if it's that, but it's if it's on Disney+, Plus and it is... The rights are from Marvel. I mean, I, everything's on Disney fucking Plus these days. It's hard... You're hard pressed to enough. find stuff that isn't on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, fair enough. But so yeah, um, it's, yeah, it's it's weird. But here's the thing, I like I like Easter eggs more than actually showing the characters. That's true. Yeah. Look, otherwise, it might be distracting. You know, we don't need a Thor episode. We just need like references to his yeah. existence. Yeah. And we get that in one of his uh, family members from the comics. At least he was mysteriously left out of the movies. I don't know why. Boulder, who is killed by you know. Modok's trash. Here's the thing, though, in the comics and in actual Norse mythology, the death of Baldi is what tri- triggers the Asgardian apocalypse. No one brings that up. Like, I... technically, Modok has started Ragnarok now. <laughs> By just dumping his trash. By just dumping his trash. <laughs> Loki's off in the distance, like, son of a bitch, that's my job. <laughs> Well, but, he was trying too hard, Loki. Yeah, it's that simple. Just dump the trash. But yeah, it needs to I, be a bit more low key. <laughs> oh hi! Thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. I thought it was funny. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah. Lou visits him. Um, I don't know if it's this episode, episode or not, where actually Monica also visits Aim. Because she's trying to give her son a peanut allergy, uh-huh. because she mentioned on her lifestyle vlog that her son has been battling a peanut allergy. Turns out he doesn't have a peanut allergy, so she needs to make that happen. This was, I don't know if that's it, this episode, but it's the first instance where I realized, oh, this character's got a dark side. I like that. Yep. She also bonds with Monica over their shared disdain of Modoc. That's fun. But uh, Lou ends up uh, in aim this episode and accidentally goes through the trash portal and Modoc has to go and rescue him. And the whole episode about it's about him trying to reconcile how weird Lou is. Like, fucking pot. Have you met the kettle? You know, you're of a similar hue. It's, it, I don't know. Because he's got this whole thing where he wants to do magic at his bar mitzvah. Also, side note, Modoc is Jewish. It's not the weirdest thing in this show, but it's up there. I don't know. I mean... I don't think much about that. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, they don't I, reference it a lot. It's just it's mainly centered don't. around Lou um, getting a bar mitzvah, and the whole episode is Modok accidentally getting damaged when he gets him to Asgard, and uh, desperately trying to find his son to the point of starting a full scale war 
between um, kobolds, which look nothing like actual Dungeons and Dragons kobolds, by the way. I know there's different variations, like definitions of kobold, but kobolds are supposed to be tiny little underground lizard people, and these are not them. They're weird little grey goblin people. I'm just saying. I know this isn't in the D&D universe, but, I mean, Omar, you can see with the web- webcam, I've got a Dungeons and Dragons poster right next to me. There's a dragon on it and everything. Yeah, this is personal for you, which I get, and uh, I will validate your opinion. Hooray! Absolutely. <laughs> I feel seen. <laughs> so, starts a war with these uh, the kobolds and uh, makes up with Lou. There's a whole side joke about him getting rid of important weapons in order to make little figurines for like chess moves and stuff. And it's revealed at the end of the episode when speaking to uh, the rabbi that Moda realizes that Lou's whole weirdness regarding his magic tricks is him trying to push people away because he's trying to emotionally isolate himself uh, in preparation for his parents' divorce. And it's like, oh, that's actually clever and impactful on an emotional level. Yeah, and it's human. It's very human, exactly. Uh, someone who is not human, but has nevertheless been mistreated like so many are, um, is a super adaptoid because he's finally had one insult too many. And he joins up with, the, I guess, the overarching villain of the show outside of the living corporation, yeah. which turns out to be, remember when we said Modok went to the past and met his younger self? That version of himself has now traveled through to the present and is determined to destroy Modok for not being as dedicated to his whole take over the world plan as he should be because of his family. That is pretty fucking cool. Yeah, I love that storyline. And then we get the next episode where... Oh god, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Jody dates Wanda Man. You familiar with Wanda Man at all? I actually know. I, I wasn't familiar with him. I was uh, vaguely familiar with him. We've seen him popped up in a few uh, miscellaneous mm-hmm. material like uh, Avengers Earth Mighty's Heroes show... And uh, the Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 video game. And he's... I mean, there was a time when he was a card-carrying Avenger. Because, like, the whole thing about him is, like, his brother is the supervillain, the Grim Reaper. And his brainwave patterns were used to help give life to Vision. And so he's... Apparently, yeah. So he's got an established, uh, you know, backstory in terms of the Marvel universe. Quite significant. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. Nowadays, because I mean, his whole shtick was that he was a superhero, but he was also an actor, which was pretty unique, actually, for the time, until suddenly they kept on doing that. Like, there are so many fucking superhero reality shows in the comics. And the New Warriors did it. I think DC people did it at one point. And then, like, the West Coast Avengers did it. I read one issue of West Coast Avengers. And it's like, okay, they're getting Gwenpool in there. Sure, fine, that's cool, I guess. Weird choice. So what's the whole setup of the show? Oh, it's it's a reality show. I am out. I am yep. done. No, thank you. Yep. Oh See no, you. this is much worse. So yep. not not a big fan of that. So and but here's the thing with Wonder Man, recent uh portrayals of him have really bigged up the whole acting part of him. Uh-huh. So now that he's like a superhero, yes, but he's also shouldn't be like sort of vain, self-absorbed and, you know, pure Hollywood elite. And he's kind of like that here, but also with a you know, human edge, uh, voiced by Nathan Fillion, who's great. Yeah. And <laughs> I, he's pretty cool because he starts dating Jody, and Modoc really doesn't like that. So he goes to his daughter to help, help him get a makeover. Which honestly kind of works. Oh no, he's hot! <laughs> Facelift and stuff. It's, it's weird. <laughs> and, uh, it's, but this whole thing, it turns out, has been uh, exaggerated by Jodie uh, at the behest of her agent publisher, whoever, who's like the typical, you know, agent, pure evil, mm-hmm. big up the brand sort of character. Like, it, I'm here's the thing. it's yeah. funny, it's creative. But it's definitely something we've seen before. Yeah, it's we've seen many times. Oh, Jack Horseman. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it all comes to a head when a Modoc <laughs> and Wonder Man fight. 
uh, at like her big book launch party, yeah. which is sort of something that uh, Jody helped exacerbate. This leads to Wonder Man breaking up with Jody, as it turns out, like, while, yes, he does like the attention he gets from being a celebrity and he is surrounded by people constantly photographing him, he doesn't, that wasn't why he was with Jody. He liked Jody for Jody. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, I'm surprised they made Wonder Man so, well, not deep, but not entirely shallow, I guess. Yeah, he has, he has a layer or two. You know? Yeah. And, uh... and uh, it's just so interesting because. I like relationships where the two characters are not equally, but definitely differently flawed. And I don't like relationships where one character is the fuck up and one character is like the level headed. Oh, you need to get your act together because that's boring. I like that both he and Jody are kind of psychos in their own way. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's just not fun when, when you have that like flawed character and one who's like, Always like the the stick the same in the mud, the yeah, you know, the average steady sort of thing. I mean, yeah, some of the be- I think I mean we talked about the Simpsons earlier. Some of the best episodes of the Simpsons were the ones where we show Marge's neuroses. I think a great example of that actually is the episode where uh, the lemon tree gets stolen and Bart and a bunch of others go over to Shaberville to get it, and he doesn't trick them, but his parents think that. Uh, he's taken a tutoring job and they're both sort of equally in the dark Homer for different reasons Marge for different reasons and their reactions uh, Homer's reaction when finding out the truth is let's form a mob and storm Shebyville (laughs) Marge's reaction is Homer come quick Bart quit his tutoring job and has joined a violence gang like (laughs) (laughs) yeah I love that quote so much. That that is the best thing because I don't like the episodes where Marge is just like, "Oh, I'm the stick of the mud." I like it where she's like, she's kind of a stick in the mud, but she's also got her own unique way of being a stick in the mud. You know, she's an yeah. interesting character. She's fully developed, and she's not just not um just so bland and it's not uh, generic. You know, it doesn't make yeah. make her generic. And honestly, a another show that initially did that, but then moved away from that, but in a really bad way, was Family Guy, where they just made every single character supremely unlikable. I fucking hate that show now, because not... I'm not a fan. I I don't care if it's got, like, cool psychos, like, Hi, Chris! You're selling your old hand-me-downs? I just got these short shots. Sweet Jesus. That's, like, the only one I can do. Can I do Quagmire? Hey, Peter! Give it a try. No. Um, hey, Barney. I can only just do that referencing other characters. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, no. Oh, no. Is, I'm not going to stop. That? Which one I, is I'm that? Not, that's... that's Bruce. I'm not going to do Stewie. Oh. I could do Stewie. Oh, you know I you have, do Stewie. You have to do Stewie. Brian, do we have any graham crackers? Hey, Brian, what happened to Gina Davis? She used to be in movies, but she's not in movies anymore. She's pretty enough when she smiles, there's too much gum. No good tooth to gum ratio. Chris? It's, I, 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 don't, no. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> anyway, I, it's not fantastic. It's just because I've got the accent. I've got the accent prepared. You know, I'm, it's cheating. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to fucking talk about that show. We're talking about Modoc. Yeah. And so uh, we get more sided things with young Modoc, Super Adaptoid. It's revealed that they've also <laughs> recruited Arcade from the X Men. Uh, I always like when he pops up because he's he's. So, are you familiar with Arcade? Um, not really. I haven't read a lot of uh, X Men comic books actually. So, Arcade is a hitman with the most supremely inefficient and pointless method of assassination ever. He kidnaps people and puts them in this fairground like sprawling attraction which presumably must cost at least in the low millions to build full of deadly traps and that's how he kills people i mean he charges a lot of money for his services but if i wanted someone dead i was just like okay so i could either go with the crazy guy with red hair and a bow tie who's gonna put the someone i want dead in a weird like joker meets saw trap or I could go with a guy with a sniper rifle. 
I'm going with sniper rifle guy. <laughs> I mean, it depends. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah, it's it's a bit of a it's it's a long process, but I I don't know. It's it's. It's funny. I don't it, know. It's comical. Oh, it's very funny. Especially yeah. when he's voiced by Alan Tudyk. That was... That's the, I don't know that's the actor who voiced him. That is that is the actor who voices him. Okay, I like that. Yeah, he voices Arcade. And I, I, I knew he was in this somewhere. I couldn't remember because there's a couple of voices that I think he could have done. But uh, turns out... Uh, no, your voice is arcade. Uh, next episode, seventh episode. No, no, no. no so it's next ep- It's the eighth episode. Um, Modok tries to make amends with his family and is immediately taken back by Jody, who's been doing a lot of soul searching. And it seems like, you know, things are going uh, pretty well for him on the family front, except it turns out that his family are robots. Yep. And then there's even more robots. This whole thing has been set up by young Modok and Arcade. And then it... I'm, I'm going to spare you the details of Modok figuring stuff out and a whole bunch of different robots. It turns out there are three different versions of every single member of the family. Two are robots. One is the real person. They all believe they're the real person. They're placed in this room and they've got to figure out who's who by killing each other. And... If they don't try and do that, they'll be killed anyway. And it's a it's a classically demented idea, and it's yeah. played for laughs. Uh, <laughs> very funny. And a couple of them get accidentally killed. It's just like, oh, did we actually kill the real one? Oop, no, robot chip. It's fine. And again, how much does Arcade charge? I think he mentioned in the episode he charges $1 million. You managed to create perfectly lifelike robots with actual like real blood and guts with them except for like one robot chip and you're telling me that cost you less than a million dollars like e- even assuming you want to have a profit no yeah, he's coming out with a loss but maybe he's doing taxes have... like on your fairground <laughs> you know you know property taxes stuff like that it's, it, i know you're kooky arcade but seriously i i don't want to be your accountant jesus christ i mean maybe he's doing it for for, for the you know, for the laughs. Maybe he's that demented, but... For the jollies. I mean... For there's... the jollies. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's... I mean, but there's worse motivations to have, if I'm honest. It's and, true. true. Uh, Mo- young Modoc reveals all of his plans, super adaptoid, and, you know, is like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm betraying you. And they're like, we really don't care. It's very funny. Uh, it ends with all the robots dead, except for uh, there's two Lou's left. Yeah. And they just keep the other Lou around, which I actually really like. And the two Lou's really like each other. They make no attempt to differentiate between the two. Nope. There's just, now there's two Lou's. Okay, fine. And I'm they both like... agree to get the same food. So that'd be fun for them. But it ends with Jody killing young Modoc using her Pilates to rip him in half using her bare hands. Stop! Stop! He's already dead! It's kind of horrifying. Yeah, it's... it's <laughs> talk about gore earlier, I mean... <laughs> like, cleanly down the mid- middle, skull and all, just like... <laughs> it's... I know it's animated and it's not meant to be taken 100% seriously, but Jesus fucking Christ... I don't even think the Hulk could do that. Not not in that short amount of time. Just like Pilates pool, grabs him by his hair and just like... Just rip, starts ripping. Just <laughs> neatly. <laughs> oh, God. Like, whoa, okay. Also, I was like, she could do that. Yeah. Interesting. I, I guess I need to fucking go to Pilates. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Uh, then we get the second to last episode. Um... Modoc basically has an epiphany and decides, you know what I'm going to do? Even though I've been demoted, but I've got my family back, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to accept life. And now we get chill Modoc, happy Modoc, good subservient work Modoc, working in the mail room. And he's just like, I'm going to try something new and I'm going to try and actually be good at my job and just work within the company. And Everyone is really confused by this, especially Monica, who believes this is part of some dastardly plot to kill her. 
And in fairness, given his past track record, that's a reasonable assumption. But she just can't handle normal Modoc. She goes fucking demented. Yeah, she's she's used to the over the top Modoc. <laughs> Oh god. I mean, and yeah. This is where the plot starts to ramp up a bit because uh Austin, like we said, has been working for the Living Corporation, revealed the Living Corporation is gonna kill everyone on the planet. Austin mm-hmm. just now thinks that might be a bad idea when they say that they're going to kill his like little schnauzer dog Sherlock. Isn't that the the arc of every antagonist? They make a deal with the devil but then regret it. Yes. Oh, sure, I'm happy to kill all <clears throat> sentient life on the planet. Wait, you're going to kill one dog? This shall not stand! <laughs> and that's when I got mad. So, he tries desperately to warn Modoc not to fix, like, this Alexa knockoff thing called the Grome. Because huh? um, the, the running joke is the Grome has been zapping people and killing them, and Modoc's trying to, you know, fix that. Yeah. And... Meanwhile, uh, Monica is trying to kill Modoc because she thinks she, he's going to kill her. Meanwhile, Gary's going to try and kill Austin because he thinks that Austin is Austin is the root of all Modoc's problems. And again, it's a bit of a comedy of errors, but they mix it up a little because yeah. it's like Modoc just in the middle of these three other characters just whose plots are revolving around him. It's pretty clever, actually. And then it all comes to head when Modoc. Uh, assembles a board meeting and says, hey, so um, I have sold my shares and aim to Iron Man. So Iron Man now owes the company. The board's like, oh, but you don't have a controlling interest. Okay, Monica, do you want to st- sell your shares? Hands are something. And she's like, yes, I do. So now Iron Man owns AIM and I guess Grumble and releases the Grom, which turns out... um was fixed pretty quickly in terms of the whole killing people, but it was then yeah. implanted by Modoc with a signal that drives all animals insane. And that's how he gets revenge on Grumble and uh, Iron Man. And he starts his own company with Monica, AIM 2, but he's got like little dashes in it. So it's like distinct from AIM, which has like periods in it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. And- I mean- Meanwhile, Austin desperately tries to warn him about uh, the co- the company and uh, the board and you know the living corporation. And despite having gone through many adventures throughout the episode to try and warn him, ends up getting killed by Gary in a car. So anticlimactic, isn't it? Well, this is a kick in the knickers. It's yeah, it's it's a bit anticlimactic. I think that's part of the joke. Never really yeah. cared for Austin anyway. Uh, uh, no. And here's the thing: you think, you think that would be the end of the series. It seems like they wrapped up everything in a pretty neat bow. He's got his family back for the most part. His problems with Aim are all but over. There's new challenges on the horizon, to be sure, but there's got to be, you know, some resolution to the series. There's one more episode. At one a, more episode. At Lou's bar mitzvah, and. Uh, we get the whole Modoc and Melissa try and wrangle some kids to go to the bar mitzvah. This is the whole casting thing. We're not going to talk about that because it's fucking pointless. It doesn't mm-hmm. add to anything. But then at at the bar mitzvah, he's got a scene with Lou and, just, and Lou's a bit despondent. He's like, why are you despondent? Is it because like, no kids came? No, it's because since this party started, you haven't talked to me once. I, I just wanted to dance with you. And Joe's like, oh, you wanted to dance with your mum? No, I wanted to dance with dad. Okay, fine, I gave birth to you, but whatever. And it's a really nice scene with Modoc and the two Lou's dancing. Mm-hmm. And it's interrupted by what we thought was the actually dead young Modoc reappearing. And it was just like, it was a robot, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a robot. Yeah, yeah. I did wonder why when they killed that Modoc, present day Modoc didn't fade out of existence. That doesn't get explained later, but uh, it turns out, so, so Modoc, young Modoc, sorry, turns up, big robot character, tries to kill his family, and Modoc tries to stop him, but then young Modoc freezes time. I can't remember exactly how that happened. Yeah. And he reveals that he's not actually young Modoc, he is the anomaly. 
it's easier to call him the anomaly. I kind of wish yeah. it started sooner. It would have been my, <laughs> it less confusing. Yeah. I've just been calling him like board short Mo- Modoc because he's wearing board shorts the whole time with like a hoodie because <laughs> he's in university. He's from a time. It turns out in yep. like the second episode when he had his confrontation with Modoc, he got a bunch of time crystals embedded in his forehead. And uh, this meant that he was separated outside of the space time uh, continuity. So like yep. Modoc's previous life, him as a young person, he was still there and still that timeline was still intact. But this individual, this young Modoc, was sort of adrift in space and time. So he went back to the present to try and help Modoc uh, by killing his family. And Modoc was like, yeah, but my family give me strength and they're, they're good for me. And he's like, yes. What, really? Yo, yeah, absolutely. But here's the thing. And then here's the anomaly the- shows Modoc like a whole bunch of alternate futures where Modoc dies. Most of the time by being killed by the Avengers in his bid to take over the world. Some mm-hmm. of the time shitting himself to death on the toilet. Uh, or vomiting, yes. Or, or vomiting, or, or his heart stopping, or, or, or lasagna. one drowning in the bowl. Like, I, I, I wanted to see that one, actually. I was a bit curious. How is that possible? Like, How is that possible? That's a very good point. I mean, a, a lot of toilet-based death. And this yeah. severely just hard, Modoc. And the anomaly reveals that, look, I had it wrong. I thought your family were weakness. Turns out they are your strength by dying. They're, the grief you feel fuels you into taking over the world. And then he shows him this alternate future where his vision of a utopia truly does exist. We're yeah. Like, oh, what's Modoc going to do? What's Modoc going to do? It flashes forward to the future where he let his family die and is now desperately trying to bring them into the the future present, I guess. The, the, the current somehow. present that was future. Uh, yeah, the current present that was future. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Yeah. And that's when the series ends with future Emperor Modoc wanting to have it all, have his glorious utopia, but also get his family back. I mean, honey, I like, you've got a big storm coming. I like that ending. I did I not liked see it. it coming. Oh, me neither. And especially when, like, making the decision often, uh, generally speaking, I would say American TV shows or movies, they would opt for the quote unquote happy ending, right? The one yeah. that, well, not the happy ending, the one that's. Well, maybe a little know, hint of something dark on the horizon. Yeah. But, like, Often they would pick their fa- the family and loved ones, but no, 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 no. He picked power, yeah. and but here's the thing. Um, he, I think that he picked power, knowing that he can bring them back. But if he if he picked them, he can't pick uh, that future where he actually rules the world. I mean, yeah, I, I think he always the intent to I try don't and bring know. Back. I don't know, but that was this is something that could be explored in the second season. It's yeah, I like that open ending, and I like that it wasn't resolved. It just There's, reminds you, yeah. Oh wait, this is a bad guy. Yeah, because yeah, true. Because throughout the season, he actually tries to develop a relationship with his kids and mend things with his wife, right? Mm. But in the end, we're like, oh. Oh, he's a villain. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it fucking ends. Now, we're going to talk about our fun thoughts in just a second. But before we do that, here are some ads. And we're back. Okay. So, um, some bumps, some speed bumps here and there, some odd stylistic choices, some weird tangents. But ultimately, I think a really solid first season for a great animated show. Okay, yes, it is. I agree. I said I, I've said my um, opinion on the comedy of it and yeah. how I would have liked them to focus on the plot and just make it a little bit um, not stronger, but like more solid. Yeah, but I a, agree with a, you. A, it's the foundation that's lacking. Yeah, yeah. And- but I agree with you. That's it's. it's it is a good first season. It does set up a lot of stories as well. And it does uh, raise intrigue a lot. And it is ballsy. I like that about the show. 
It takes risks. Yeah. It knows what it's doing for the most part, at least. And it's got a very clear creative uh, vision, creative direction. Um, yeah. Pat Oswalt knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, that's, knows what that's he's one doing. thing. Yeah. And I liked, regarding the ending, I liked it, something about it that a lot of a lot of shows and movies don't do. It is... I don't know if you want to classify it as a happy ending or a sad ending or neither. Bittersweet? Not even that. It's... It's a dark ending. Oh, it's definitely but, dark. But he gets what he wants somehow. Anyway. I know the feeling, Cursed Monkey <laughs> I like when, when a character achieves what they want to do what they want to achieve in that goal, Probably but they lose something. Delaying, you know? But I want them to lose something. I want it at a price. Like, um, I was discussing this with my brother the, the other day about Black Panther. I'm going to say spoilers in case no one has seen it yet, because I've actually watched it recently, uh, a few months ago. Um, in the middle of the film, Black Panther is thrown off the cliff, right? Yes. Like, I we both, killed Mufasa. <laughs> yes, that moment. But we know he's coming back. We yeah. know he's not going to die. And then at the end of the film, in the final battle, there was a moment where, um, I forgot the villain's name. Kill um, he, Yeah, he wants to kill his sister, right? Yeah. We know he's not going to kill his sister. It's just obvious. You just know these things. And he does retain his throne, let's say, and, and the kingdom and everything. And he won without a price. Nothing actually happened yes they yeah. revealed wakanda to the world i guess but that's that's a good thing but he chose that as well he didn't have to do that he he, chose exactly that. when i watched uh modok i was like okay he got what he wanted but at a really hefty price and i like that i like that because it it develops the character even further yeah it means like okay so now we've got another obstacle to overcome but also yeah. it comes at the cost of character growth and development exactly. and yeah i i do like that now you say that out loud i really do like that about the show and that's something that, that's not something that's endemic to black panther just as an example it's something that know. could be used more and more of certain things like okay we got what we wanted but we had to make a sacrifice yeah and we had to learn something and this is something that Emphasize that because in a world of comic book stuff where things are always at risk of becoming stagnant and adhering to the status quo, when you've got a story that has dares to make a solid, tough decision and stick with it, that's something worth paying attention to, I think. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I, I, it's not a knock against Black Panther. Black Panther was, no, no, no. you know, it was... There were greater things at play, like the Avengers and everything, right? It had to have that kind of ending. But it was just an example to, to this kind of uh, writing and endings. Yeah, and it and honestly, there are dark endings to shows that really don't fit with those shows that sort of come out of nowhere. Yeah. Not the case with this, because he's been talking since episode one that he wants to build this mm-hmm. utopia. He's willing to do anything to do it. Like yes, yes, us absolutely. episode one. Absolutely, and it's it's quite appropriate to the character that they've uh, established and have built. And like you said, they remind us this guy's not a good guy. He's not the best of guys. And also, just because you are a bad guy does not mean you are a bad guy. Exactly. I can't and, believe I quoted fucking Wreck-It Ralph. I'm ashamed of myself. When does it? Yeah, we'll move on. We'll move on. Well, anyway. Um, so yeah, I just want to question myself when I, I watch the show next season. Hmm. Do I want to root for this guy or not? Well, I think you don't have to root for him. You can not root for him the same way we don't root for Rick from Rick and Morty. Bad guy does objectively horrible things. We just enjoy the time we spend with him. And we don't need to relate to a character. We don't need to identify a character. No. We don't need to like a character. Or we do need to like a character. We just need to enjoy the time we spend with them. You know, when people but, watch documentaries about Hitler, they're not secretly rooting for Hitler. Although, actually, given the state of the world, maybe some of them are rooting for Hitler. But <laughs> most people, most normal people, are not rooting for Hitler. They just yeah. want to learn more about Hitler. And yeah. 
that's what we're doing. There's, we're taking the time in this first season to learn about Modoc and enjoy the time with, we have with him. And for my money, at least, I did enjoy the time we had with him. And on that note, I think we're going to end the show. Thank you very yep. much, Omar, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Um, and I got to say, uh, you're changing my opinion on the show a little bit. I'm convincing, finally. Yes. <laughs> it's only taken five fucking years, but finally convince someone of something at last. Soon my empire will be complete. <laughs> but if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends, shout it from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and just some of our other super episodes. Like we mentioned before, our Invincible episode. Check that out. It was a lot of fun. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or at podgibbs.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ep2hyc. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. Cue the music! Cue the music!